decisions that can deprive Russian evil of, of any power. You can start this policy today. It is in your power to make a Rammstein of tanks, not to bargain about different numbers of tanks, but to open a principled supply that will stop Russian evil. Some fear that sending Leopard tanks could mean an escalation of the war and drag NATO into a direct confrontation with Russia. The tanks have been sold to dozens of countries around the world. Those who want to export them to Ukraine need permission from Germany first. After weeks of international pressure, Germany has made it clear that it will take a decision on whether or not to send Leopard tanks to Ukraine in its own time. President Zelensky's plea that time is not a luxury his country has had little effect, because Germany says it's a decision that needs to be carefully weighed. Despite the setback, there have been promises Everyone of new military hardware for Ukraine. U.S. Defense Secretary Austin urging countries not to waste too much time. This is a, a decisive decade for the world. And this is a decisive moment for Ukraine's struggle to defend itself. So this contact group will not slow down. We're going to continue to dig deep. And based upon the progress that we've made today, I'm confident that Ukraine's partners from around the globe are determined to meet this moment. In Berlin, a group of protesters also tried to put pressure on the government to take a decision on sending Leopard tanks sooner rather than later. Step fast in Al Jazeera at Rammstein Air Base. Well, Ali Hashim has the reaction from the Kremlin. It's a matter of concern for Moscow, and we can see that in the lines coming from the Russian foreign ministry that sees uh, 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 supplying uh, Kiev with more weapons will escalate the situation as per the foreign ministry and will cause more casualties. The foreign ministry also accused the West of uh, hypocrisy for ignoring the uh, casualties on the other side of the borders as uh, per uh, the, the Russians. Now, also the, the Kremlin uh, warned that this uh, uh, the supply of weapons will take the uh, conflict into another level and will put NATO face to face with the Russians. It urged, uh, the Kremlin urged the uh, Western uh, um, alliance uh, to uh, take into consideration the concerns of Moscow because this could help de-escalate. However, uh, Peskov, Dmitry Peskov, the spokesperson for, for Kremlin, said that nothing is going to change in the field and this is, this is just uh, uh, creating more targets for the, for the Russians. And, you know, this is uh, uh, kind of uh, escalating the, the rhetoric here in, in Moscow. Moscow, uh, with, the mo with more concerns now, is also taking into consideration the situation with respect to its public opinion. So it's uh, reaching to the foreign, foreign uh, countries, uh, trying to uh, give a, a position, a stance, but also trying to soothe the concerns inside the country and try to uh, convey a message that there are still options, trying to raise the stake and say everything is going to uh, according to the plan. Well, dozens of people have been injured in Peru as police confronted crowds demanding the resignation of President Dino Boluarte. Tens of thousands of people from all over the country are marching in the capital. They want Congress shut down, elections and a new constitution. Boluarte has accused them of trying to seize power and has warned that anyone breaking the law will be prosecuted. At least 50 people have been killed in confrontations with security forces since early December. An impeachment, a new president and a state of emergency. A lot has happened in Peru since former leader Pedro Castillo tried to dissolve Congress. On December the 7th, he was removed from office and replaced by the vice president, Dina Boluarte. Castillo was detained on December and charged with rebellion and conspiracy. Protests broke out in his strongholds, which are rural areas mostly in the south of Peru. A nationwide state of emergency was declared on December the 14th as protesters blocked roads and stormed airports. Then this week, a two-day national strike was held in the capital, but it spread into a third day, and people say they won't leave until their demands are met. Mariana Sanchez has more now from Lima. Well, these protesters have been clashing with police for the third night in a row. They are here, and about a block away is a police that has been throwing tear gas at them. The police has blocked the access towards the entry of Presidential Palace and Congress, but protesters are in different parts of the surrounding areas, clashing with police, throwing rocks at them. I am from Puno. I want to inform people of the reality of this forgotten rural Peru, a region that not only has poverty but also malnutrition. The Peruvian state has forgotten our region, our children who do not have good quality health care and education. It's a region that produces copper, gold, richness that contribute to the state, yet they don't care about us. Protests have gone on in other parts of the country as well, in Cusco, in Puno, as well as in, in Arequipa, where protesters tried to take over the airport. 
These protesters say they want human rights organizations in the country to verify the prosecution of those who have killed the, the victims, the nearly 50 people that have died in the last few weeks in the protests. For now, these protesters say that no matter what, they will stay in the streets of the capital and all over the country until Dina Boluarte resigns. Well, police in Brazil have carried out raids on people suspected of being involved in the storming of government buildings earlier this month. Supporters of former President Jair Bolsonaro attacked the presidential palace, the National Congress and the Supreme Federal Court. They falsely claimed President Luis Inácio Lula da Silva lost October's elections. Monica Yanikiev has more from Rio de Janeiro. They're accused of instigating uh, what the Brazilian government is calling an attempted coup. They're being charged with trying to um, destroy democracy in Brazil, which was just back. Uh, Brazil ended its military regime in 1985. So these three people, one of them is a truck driver. Another person is a, a former uh, public servant who was working for the government of former President Jair Bolsonaro, who is now in Florida and has been there uh, since before Lula's inauguration because he did not want to pass on the presidential sash. Uh, and then there's a woman. They have been, uh, the proofs that they have against them is videos that they have posted on social media, one of them calling for the uprising and for the riots that happened on January the 8th when they stormed the presidential palace, the Congress and the Supreme Court, destroyed objects of uh, very valuable and historical objects, uh, destroyed all the windows and doors. Um, they've been posting that also. They were calling for block of oil refineries. Brazilian environmental agents have restarted anti-deforestation raids under President Lula da Silva. He has pledged to provide the Obama agency and more f with more funding and personnel to end the destruction of the Amazon. Al Jazeera spoke with the leader of the mission in the Amazon. Under the former Bolsonaro government, we worked only to solve emergency problems, doing quick jobs just to say that we were doing something, without any strategic planning from the government to really combat deforestation. To deforest an area like this, you need to spend about $580 to $1,000 per hectare. So no one's going to invest that much unless they know what they'll use the area for in the future. Those that did thought that perhaps Bolsonaro's government would continue, which in a way allowed them to occupy conservation areas and get away with committing environmental crime. The discourse of the former government created a mindset amongst people, causing many to invade areas and deforest them. They planted farms thinking that the government would eliminate indigenous lands and legalize these invasions for cattle production. Chris Hipkins will replace Jacinda Ardern as New Zealand's Prime Minister. His political career began in 2008 and he now serves as the Minister of Education and Police. He became a household name as COVID-19 Response Minister, where he mistakenly told Kiwis to spread their legs to social distance. He takes over on February the 2nd and will lead the Labour Party in elections this October. I acknowledge that at the moment we're going through some economic turbulence and we're going to have to navigate our way through that. I believe passionately that we can come out the other side of that in better shape than we went into it. Um, I'm really optimistic about our future um, and I'm really committed to leading New Zealand through that uh, in a way that is strong, stable and unifying. Well, still ahead on Al Jazeera, how low can it go? We take a closer look at Lebanon's Lera as the country's economic crisis enters a fourth year. And Tesla tweets, Elon Musk downplays the power of his social media presence during his fraud trial. It's been very warm recently in a bit of southeastern Europe, Romania, Bulgaria. But just coming into that is cloud, which has brought a lot of rain recently to the Balkan states, which have also had a history of rather a warm winter. But unfortunately, recently, more recently, it's been flooding. This is northern Kosovo and southern Serbia, still water. It's largely rivers that have overflowed their banks. Now, the rain has stopped falling now to be replaced by snow because the storm that's revolving in the central Mediterranean, this is Saturday's forecast, is uh, connected with or bringing in cold air from the north, which has already produced snow, for example, in Poland. That was quite a lot in a short amount of time. And that's all travelling now south and west through Europe. So the picture over Italy and the Balkans is a wet, windy or snowy one. A big change for some. There are warnings out, of course. And the bigger picture is that cold, snowy weather going across Germany towards the low countries. And that's with very cold air coming in from the east. Now, just touching northern Africa is that stormy stuff in uh, the Mediterranean. So, for example, in Tunisia and Algeria, windy and wet weather. And there are a few showers around West Africa. But in between, it's remarkably quiet and, of course, sunny.
You're watching Al Jazeera, a reminder of our top stories this hour. The US is designating Russia's Wagner Group as an international criminal organization. It says about 50,000 of its mercenaries are fighting in Ukraine. The classification will allow the US to apply wider sanctions to the group. Germany has not yet decided whether to send Leopard 2 tanks to Ukraine, despite pressure from NATO partners. Defence ministers from more than 50 countries met in Germany on Friday to discuss the next stage of military support for Kyiv. Protesters have been rallying for a third day in Peru's capital, calling for the resignation of President Dina Boluarte. She's accused them of wanting to overturn the government after demonstrations turned violent on Thursday. The Lebanon's currency, the lira, has lost around 95% of its value since the start of the country's economic meltdown in 2019. It's now trading at close to 50,000 to 1 against the US dollar. Now, instead of implementing much-needed reforms, the political elite is accused of creating a confusing exchange rate system that's hurting people who rely on it the most. Zain Hodder reports from Beirut. Goods, services, hospital fees, insurance, they're all priced in foreign currency. Lebanon's economy has become dollarized because the local currency is nearly worthless. We buy everything in dollars, our goods, our rent, electricity. Yes, we should price in the local currency, but it's not possible because its value keeps fluctuating. Trading is dominated by the black market exchange rate. It's hovering around 50,000 lira to the dollar, causing even more economic difficulties for people already struggling to get by. But it's not the only rate. Politicians and bankers are accused of creating a multiple exchange rate system to cover up losses in the billions of dollars. Banks have a big solvency problem. They deposited their money in the public sector at the central bank and the government. And the public sector is unable to pay them back. They have this major gap and they are trying to shift it to depositors through the haircut. And how do they do the haircut through this multiple exchange rate system? It's known as the Lawler, Lebanese dollar or bank rate, and it is used to withdraw trapped foreign currency deposits. And while the official rate has been pegged at 1,500 lira to the dollar since 1997, the government says the fiscal situation means it has to collect taxes and fees at another rate. And then there is the Syrafa rate. Syrafa is one of the policies introduced by the central bank to protect the devaluating lira. It involves pumping dollars into the market from its dwindling foreign currency reserves through this exchange platform, but it's proven to be unsustainable. Authorities are planning to increase the official rate tenfold next month, which they say will help alleviate the crisis. Economists disagree. When you are trying to um, artificially uh, fix a, um, uh, the Lebanese pound at 15,000, and everybody knows that your central bank uh, doesn't have any more any liquidity because it's actually running losses of more than $60 billion. Um, uh, so there is no credibility uh, to uh, this new exchange rate. The political and business elite are blamed for failing to implement reforms in the financial sector. Instead, they have been offering temporary solutions that many Lebanese say benefit them and worsen a crisis that's now in its fourth year. Zana Khudr Al Jazeera, Beirut. Hundreds of people have demonstrated against France in Burkina Faso's capital, Ouagadougou. Many protesters say the former colonial power's military presence has failed to improve security in the country. The UN says thousands of people have been killed since 2015 and nearly three million displaced in violence linked to armed groups. Well, staying in Burkina Faso, the army has freed a group of more than 60 women and children who were abducted by gunmen earlier this month. The unprecedented mass kidnapping happened in the northern district of Abinda. It's an area under blockade by armed groups linked to Al-Qaeda and ISIL. The captives were found by the military in a neighbouring province after being held for eight days. Well, the CEO of Tesla has sought to downplay the power of his tweets during testimony in his fraud trial in California. Elon Musk is accused of misleading investors in 2018. That's when he tweeted he'd secured funding to take his electric car company private. But it emerged the funding wasn't available and shareholders say that tweet cost them millions of dollars in trading losses. Rob Reynolds has more from Santa Monica in California. It's business as usual here at this Tesla showroom in Santa Monica, California, but several hundred kilometers to the north, Tesla's boss, Elon Musk, was in a San Francisco courtroom testifying in a trial brought by investors who say his tweets cost them money. Now, on the stand for about half an hour, Musk admitted that his tweets were a form of corporate communication that carried just as much weight as filings with government agencies for the corporation, Tesla. He also uh, admitted that uh, some people at Tesla, executives and big investors, had asked him to cool it with the tweets, to stop tweeting because it was costing the company's reputation. But the lawyers did not get to the main point of this trial. That is whether in 2018, when Musk tweeted that he had secured billions of dollars in financing to take Tesla private, 
whether Musk knew that that was false and that it was an attempt to manipulate the stock price. The investors say it was. The Securities and Exchange Commission, which is a government agency here in the United States that regulates public companies, also said that that statement was false. Uh, and they fined Musk uh, $20 million several years ago, but that did not come up at the trial today. The court has been adjourned, and Musk will take the witness stand again next week. Anti-abortion rights protesters have gathered in the U.S. for the annual so-called March for Life rally in Washington. It's the first time that the march has been held since the Supreme Court overturned the case known as Roe v. Wade in June, ending women's constitutional right to abortion. That's resulted in restrictive anti-abortion laws being passed in several states. Well, people have been demonstrating against what they described as the growing militarization of Mexico. The protests began after President Andres Manuel López Obrador ordered the National Guard to monitor Mexico City's metro system following a series of accidents. John Holman reports from the Mexican capital. The roots of this were about a couple of weeks ago when there was a crash in Mexico City's metro system between two trains, left one person dead and dozens of them injured. It wasn't the first time that it had happened in recent years. In 2021, 10, 26 people were left dead when an overpass in the metro system collapsed. Now, uh, this march is happening because after that, President Andres Manuel López Obrador said that he was going to send more than 5,000 members of the National Guard, that's a militarized police force, uh, to protect the metro installations. What if this was sabotage, was basically what he said. The people here are gathered to say that it wasn't sabotage, one, that they feel that it was negligence that caused these accidents, and two, that they're against what they see as the growing militarization in this country. A lot of activities are managed by, uh, by, Guardia, by National Guard and uh, militars, in this, Posedena and Secretaria de la Marina. For example, ports, airports, um, aduanas, customs, customs uh, migration. So we think we are in risk of, of our human rights in, in, in all the country. You can see the police now chasing after a small portion of the protesters, uh, maybe two dozen or so, that were breaking uh, shop windows along the Central Avenue here. Now, this is a small march. We're talking hundreds of people here rather than thousands. But it, it is uh, a worry in this country to some of the army getting involved, not just with national defense, but in infrastructure projects in Mexico. And what they see is a growing influence under President Andres Manuel López Obrador. The species of bird designated as vulnerable are facing a new threat in South Korea. The hooded cranes are spending winter in a UNESCO natural heritage site before they migrate to remote parts of Siberia and China. But people in the city of Suncheon are having to protect them from a severe outbreak of bird flu in the region. Eunice Kim reports. Dawn in this nature reserve, awakened by a collective cry. The hooded cranes sleep in these coastal mudflats, rich with nutrients and far from the reach of predators. In the past 10 winters, more have come to this UNESCO Biosphere Reserve to rest and recharge before mating in the spring in Russia, Siberia and remote parts of China. By late November, nearly 10,000 of the estimated 15,000 in the wild were spending the winter in Sunchan, double that of the previous season. Thanks to years of conservation efforts and farmers lending their plots, these red-patched birds, marked as vulnerable, are on the mend, making for a crowd when it comes time to eat. The reason why so many hooded cranes have come to Sunchan Bay can be found in the people's interest. And the more I study the issue, it becomes clear that preservation requires the attention of the world. The community is rolling up its sleeves to make this habitat for the hooded crane more favorable for a healthy stay. Rice grains is distributed and there's no groundwater, eliminating a key factor in the spread of the avian influenza virus. In what has been a fierce season of the bird flu, in Japan, a record caseload. Some in pools of water has led to a culling of more than 10 million birds at poultry farms. In Izumi, a top wintering site, more than 1,200 hooded cranes were found dead. Clearing out obstructions, community leaders say artificial habitats such as these, while not ideal, must be replicated, as habitat loss threatens hard-fought progress. The mayor of Sunchan, a town that removed hundreds of electric poles and wires when the flying birds got caught in them, says prosperity and ecology must work together. When you observe Sunchon Bay's preservation story, you realize how useful it was for the city's development. It helped us move into the future. Ecology leads economic growth. As this town calls for a change from business as usual, migrating birds just want to fly, as they have for millennia. Eunice Kim. Al Jazeera, Sunchon, South Korea.
Well, this is Al Jazeera, and these are the top stories this hour. The US is designating Russia's Wagner Group as an international criminal organization. It says about 50,000 of its mercenaries are fighting in Ukraine. The classification will allow the US to apply wider sanctions to the group. We continue to assess that Wagner currently has approximately 50,000 personnel deployed to Ukraine, including 10,000 contractors and 40,000 convicts. Our information indicates the Russian Defense Ministry has reservations about Wagner's